1960, the commission preparing the agenda for the Second Vatican Council, known in typical Vatican speak, is the Anti-Preparatory Commission, A-N-T-E, so it's the Preparatory Commission for the Preparatory Commission, sent all of the bishops of the world a letter saying, what would you like to talk about at this upcoming ecumenical council. I don't know whether you have the acta of the Second Vatican Council, the acts of Vatican II, the official comprehensive record of the council's debates and documents here in your library, but if you do, you can go to the first seven or eight volumes and find all of the answers that came in from then some 2,000 Catholic bishops around the world. Uh, Perhaps the most intriguing, from my point of view, was the submission from the then Archbishop of Washington, Patrick J. O'Boyle, who, like many, many other bishops who anticipated a brief council to take care of housekeeping matters in the church, a few tweaks of canon law here, a few adjustments to how bishops dealt with the Vatican there, perhaps some permissions for the use of vernacular languages and the celebration of the sacrament. So anyway, Archbishop O'Boyle sends in a list of seven housekeeping things, and then somebody had evidently told him, you know, it might sound good if you put a big think question uh, in there. So his eighth point was that the council should pronounce, in light of the doctrines of creation and redemption, on the possibility of intelligent life on other planets, which is really funny in Latin. <laughs> and when I read this in uh, an archive in the Vatican, I burst out laughing, and the archivist said, what's so funny? And I said, well, after 20 years of living in the city, if I were the Archbishop of Washington, uh, the first thing I'd like to inquire about is the possibility of intelligent life in my own diocese <laughs> before I started sweating intelligent life in alteris planetibus here. <laughs> so, we got six volumes of these responses. And one of them stands out in a very striking way. It's from a then 40-year-old auxiliary bishop of Krakow named Karol Wojtyla. And he does not send in a laundry list of church housekeeping minutiae that he wants the council to discuss. He sends in a kind of philosophical essay. An essay essentially asks the question, what happened. Why did a 20th century that began with such great hopes for the human future, a century that anticipated a maturing humanity tutored by science rising to new heights of achievement, why had that produced within its first 50 years two world wars, three totalitarian systems, oceans of blood, mountains of corpses, the greatest persecution of the church in history. What, what happened? And then he offered a possible answer to that question. He suggested that what had happened was that the great project of Western humanism had gone off the rails over the previous 300 years the net result of which was all of the awfulness of the first half of the 20th century. And at the center of that going off the rails, the center of that awfulness, were defective, desperately wrong-headed, distorted, evil ideas of the nature of the human person. And then this young Bishop Wojtyla, whom nobody in Rome had ever thought about since his nomination as Auxiliary of Krakow had been signed two years before, 
said that Vatican II should take as its great goal, as its grand strategy, if you will. The rescue of this Western humanistic project, how? By proposing Jesus Christ as the answer to the question that is every human life. And in his own contributions to the council, particularly in his contributions to the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, that is precisely what by then Archbishop Wojtyla did. In Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 22, the council fathers teach that Jesus Christ reveals both the face of the Father of Mercies and the truth about our humanity. If we want to know the truth of the human person, we look to Jesus Christ. If we know the truth about God, we look to him too. But if we also want to know the truth of the human person, we look to Jesus Christ. And then in Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 24, the Council Fathers, in a passage I am virtually certain was written by Wojtyla himself, said that the royal road to human flourishing is found in the gift of self, not in the assertion of self. That as each of our lives is a gift to us, so we are to make our lives into a gift for others. And in doing so, we will realize the capacity for nobility built into us. In the retrospect of now almost 50 years, it'll be 50 years next December 8th that the Second Vatican Council concluded with, among other things, the promulgation of the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. In the retrospect of 50 years, it now seems clear to me that those two passages from Gaudium et Spes and the way Karol Wojtyla become, become Pope John Paul II embodied those in 26 and a half years of a historic, indeed epic, pontificate, uh, marked a hinge point uh, in the history of the church. A recentering of the church on Christ and on the proclamation of Christ as the answer to the question that is every human life. From 1992 on, John Paul II began to refer to this as the new evangelization. And that's not simply a program as if it were one of the two dozen things the church is going to do in the 21st century. It's the grand strategy. More than that, it is a vision of the Catholic future that I believe marks a historic transition for which there are only four precedents in the 2,000 year history of the church. What I want to suggest here tonight, right at the beginning, is that we are moving into a new phase in Catholic history, a new way of being the one church of Christ. It's the same church because it's the same Lord, it's the same faith, it's the same baptism, but things change in the way the church manifests itself to the world. And there have been only four previous transitions of the magnitude of the transition through which we are living now. The first of those was when what became Christianity definitively parted from what became Rabbinic Judaism about the year 70 AD at the time uh, of the parting of the ways during the first Jewish war. That mode of being Catholic, that early church as we often call it, then gave way after the Constantinian settlement to what we call the Church of the Fathers, the patristic church, the church of Ambrose and Augustine. Basil and Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory Nazianzen, Gregory the Great, Maximus the Confessor, whose 
brilliant works drawn from deep faith mediated intellectually through the classical uh, heritage uh, produced those fantastic readings that we encounter uh, almost uh, every day in the Office of Readings and the Liturgy of the Hours. That patristic church had a good run. It lasted about 500 years. And then, towards the end of the first millennium, the patristic church gave birth to, even as it gave way to, what we know as medieval Christendom. The Church of Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas. The Church of Dominic and Francis. The Church of Bonaventure. The Church of, of Catherine of Siena. The Church of Pope Innocent III. And that mode of being Catholic, that way of being Catholic, um, had its good run for again about 500 years. And then, as we know, medieval Christendom fractured, fragmented, broke apart in the early 16th century, giving birth to, even as it gave way to, the Catholicism that everyone in the room over 55 years old grew up with, counter-Reformation Catholicism. The Church of the Council of Trent, the Church of Ignatius, Borromeo, Francis de Sales, Jean-Francois de Chantal, the Curie of Ars, the Little Flower, etc., etc., etc. When I was growing up in, in Baltimore, sorry all you Tigers fans, um, rub it in just a little bit, um, <coughs> uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, as when your parents were growing up in similar environments. This way of being Catholic seemed like it was good to go forever. It's the way things always were, we thought. It's the way things always would be. And yet, we now know, with the advantage of, of hindsight, that that mode of being Catholic was time conditioned historically conditioned, culturally conditioned, as had been medieval Christendom, as had been the patristic church, as had been the early church, uh, etc. And all of the turbulence that we have been experiencing in the Catholic Church for the past four decades or more, I think is the result of this transition through which we are now living the transition from counter-Reformation Catholicism to the Church of the New Evangelization, or as I called it in the book mentioned a moment ago, Evangelical Catholicism. I believe this transition began a long time ago. I think it began in 1878 with the election of Pope Leo XIII who at the very beginning of his pontificate made a bold choice, a bold strategic option, that the Catholic Church would begin to engage modernity in its cultural, economic, social, and political expressions with distinctively Catholic tools. It wouldn't roll over before modernity, as much of European Protestantism was doing at the time. It wouldn't simply reject modernity, as tended to be the grand strategy of, of several previous popes of the 19th century. Rather, it would engage modernity, but it would do so in a distinctively Catholic way. Thus, we get Leo XIII's reform of Catholic philosophy and theology, through a close study of St. Thomas Aquinas in the original. We get Leo XIII initiating modern Catholic biblical studies by founding the Pontifical Biblical Institute and the Pontifical Biblical Commission. We get Leo XIII initiating a whole new chapter in the study of the church's history by opening the Vatican archives to qualified historians, irrespective of religious position, 
uh, or indeed uh, the lack of religious conviction. And we get Leo XIII, father of what we now call the social doctrine of the church, who in 1891 in the encyclical Rerum Novarum begins this long process of Catholic wrestling with the public dimensions uh, of modernity. All of that stuff that Leo XIII set in motion rippled through the church, not without difficulty, for the next 60 or so years. It produced, among other things, a great revival of Catholic intellectual and pastoral life in the church's European heartland, even amidst the extraordinary difficulties of two world wars. And it was the intention of John the 23rd, now St. John the 23rd, in summoning the Second Vatican Council to try to gather up all of this energy that had been set loose from the late 19th century on and focus it through the prism of a general or ecumenical council. Why? So that, as the Pope put it, the church might experience a new Pentecost, might experience a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And why would you want to do that? So that you could go out and convert the world. Not Pentecost for Pentecost's sake, but Pentecost for precisely the reasons identified in the second chapter of Acts in order to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen as the answer to the question that is every human life. Then what happened? Turmoil. There's a good reason we've only had 21 ecumenical councils in the history of the church. Every one of them has been born from controversy, conducted in controversy, and resulted in controversy. <laughs> These things are a big mess. They really shake things up. And that's what happened for 20 years after Vatican II. Vatican II was a very interesting council in the sense that unlike the 20 previous councils, Vatican II did not provide authoritative keys for unlocking its meaning. If you want to know what the Council of Nicaea meant, you look at its creed. In fact, you look at it every Sunday, so you really get to know what it meant. If you want to know what the Council of Ephesus or the Council of Chalcedon, the two great Christological councils, of the early fifth century meant you read their dogmatic definitions. Mary is Theotokos, God bearer or mother of God, and you read Chalcedon on the relationship of humanity and divinity in uh, Christ. Two natures, one divine person. If you, know, want to know what, if you want to know what other councils meant, you read the canons, the laws, that they legislated for the church's legal structure. If you want to know what still other councils meant, you read the heresies and he they condemned. Uh, and if you want to know what still other councils meant, you read the catechisms they commissioned. One of the angles of, of understanding we have on the Council of Trent is the catechism of the Council of Trent. Vatican II did none of that. It wrote no creed, it commissioned no catechism, it condemned no heresies, it defined no dogmas, it wrote no canons into the legal code of the church. It gave us 16 documents, but there were no keys for unlocking the overarching meaning of the exercise. And so you got 20 years of a bit of chaos and confusion. And then the providence of God uh, raised up uh, two men of genius, both of whom had played important roles at Vatican II, one Polish, the other Bavarian. And in the 35 years of the pontificates of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, which I think have to be understood as one single arc, the church was given an authoritative interpretation of Vatican II. 
or to vary the metaphor, the church was given the thread by which to weave those 16 pieces of cloth, the documents of Vatican II, into a single beautiful Catholic tapestry. And the thread, which was first defined in 1985 at a special meeting of the Synod of Bishops called by John, the 20, uh, John Paul II to mark the 20th anniversary of Vatican II and deeply influenced by a book called The Ratzinger Report. At that synod in 1985, the thread, the key, was identified as the idea of the church as a communion of disciples in mission. All three nouns being important. Discipleship is first. Friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ, as Benedict XVI insisted for the eight uh, years of his pontificate, is central to the Christian faith. Friendship with the Lord leading to radically converted discipleship. But that friendship is not as some of our evangelical Protestant friends sometimes think it is, merely me and Jesus. That discipleship incorporates me into the body of the church, the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ in Pius XII's formulation, in which each of the members relate to each other somewhat like cells in a human body. And the term that the Synod Fathers came up with in 1985 to discuss this unique set of relationships, which is unlike any other, it's not like a family, although it has aspects of the family. It's not like a political community, although it has politics. Uh, it's not merely a voluntary association. It, it's just different from all of that. The word they came up with was the Latin word communio or communion. It's a communion of disciples. But that communion of disciples, to get to the third noun, does not exist for itself alone. In fact, it betrays itself if it thinks of itself as existing for itself alone. It exists to give away the gift that it has been given. It exists for a mission. And everyone in that communion of disciples must think of himself or herself as a missionary. John Paul II wrote about this in the encyclical of 19, December 1990, Redemptoris Missio. He began to use the term the new evangelization, as I mentioned in 1992, uh, at the celebrations of the fifth centenary of the evangelization of the Western Hemisphere in Santo Domingo uh, in the Dominican Republic. He made the idea of putting out into the world in mission the centerpiece of his pastoral apostolic letter concluding the great jubilee of 2000, Novo Millennio in Aunte, entering the new millennium, which the central biblical metaphor is the Lord's command to the disciples in Luke chapter five, put out into the deep for a catch. But perhaps most powerfully, John Paul II embodied this vision of the Catholicism of the third millennium, the Catholicism of the new evangelization, during his jubilee pilgrimage to the Holy Land. I've thought about that a lot in the last 14 years. I was actually there uh, for NBC uh, at the time. But it was only when I began writing the second volume of the biography that I had to really wrestle with the question, why did he do that? 
I mean, in 1980, in 2000, the uh, Pope was almost 80 years old. The Parkinson's had been eating away at him for about six years. He had an extraordinarily full schedule for the entire year in Rome. So why this Holy Land pilgrimage? Well, part of the answer is that it, it satisfied a desire of his own Christian pilgrim's heart. Another part of the answer is that he wanted to remind the world in a dramatic way, he was a man of the drama, uh, that the year 2000 wasn't just about putative computer bugs that were going to shut everything down. <laughs> Everybody remember Y2K? <laughs> but at, a, at the deepest level, I think what John Paul II was doing was picking up the entire Catholic Church, putting it on his still broad but now bent back, and carrying us with him to the places of salvation history so that we could see and hear and touch and smell and feel that Christianity does not rest on a nice story. It's not a pious myth. Real things happen to real people in places you can still go and touch. And those people were so transformed by that that they went out and transformed the world. That encounter, first with the young Rabbi Jesus from Nazareth, later with the risen Lord who exploded all of their expectations of what Messiah meant, what resurrection meant, what salvation meant, what God's work in history meant. That encounter was so life transforming that they went out and changed the world. I think I may have mentioned to the uh, Steubenville pilgrimage group when we were in Rome together at the time of the canonizations. Did you guys ever get dessert that night? I, that was a <laughs> It's a long story. Um, I often say to friends who are going to Rome, perhaps for the first time, when you're standing there in St. Peter's Square and you're looking at that colossal basilica and you're admiring the embrace of the Bernini colonnades, the Moderno facade, the Michelangelo dome, Ask yourself this, how did a probably illiterate day laborer from east of nowhere, as the world then understood somewhere, get here to what was then the center of world history and get himself the world's greatest tombstone? Because that's what St. Peter's is. I mean, it's a lot of things. It's the stage on which the global drama of Catholicism is played out. It's a great papal cemetery. There are well over 100 popes buried in St. Peter's. It's an engineering, architectural, decorative marble. But fundamentally, it's the world's greatest tombstone. How did that happen? How did the bones of this guy from east of nowhere, which you can get as close to in St. Peter's as I am to the first row. How did that happen? What John Paul was doing all through that Holy Land pilgrimage was reminding us that that and so many other things happen because of an encounter with Jesus Christ that so transformed the lives of those men and women, that they felt compelled to go out and convert the world. And in that, I think we get something of a profile of this church of the new evangelization or evangelical Catholicism. It is a church, first of all, of radical discipleship. And by radical discipleship, I mean, a discipleship that is not one facet of our identity, 
but is the center from which everything else flows. Our lives as members of families, our lives as members of religious communities, our lives as citizens, our lives as consumers, everything flows from that radical discipleship. But to be that kind of a radically converted disciple means a life of ongoing catechesis and formation. About 15 years ago, I was asked to be the confirmation sponsor for a very fine young man uh, who, after the ceremony, we were out to dinner, I said to him, so, what does all that mean? He said, well, it means religion class is over. <laughs> till, till, you know, that, no, no. In the church of the new evangelization, in the evangelical Catholicism of the future, religion class is never over. It's all the time. It's a lifelong commitment. The Catholicism that has a chance of converting the world in the 21st century is a Catholicism that is far more deeply steeped in the Bible than Catholics have been in a very long time. Uh, a much more biblically literate Catholicism that allows us to see the world through biblical lenses, and it's a much more catechetically thick Catholicism, if you will. Happily, we have all sorts of great tools for that uh, today, for that lifelong learning, including books written by members of your faculty, uh, remarkable multimedia, uh, presentations of the faith, like uh, my friend Father Bob Barron's Catholicism series, Above all, we have the Catechism of the Catholic Church, <clears throat> which has a lifetime of learning uh, within it. And if you buy that and the compendium to it that Ignatius Press, Paul Bush, which has all of the texts referenced in it, you've got a lifetime of learning right there. And it's gonna be necessary because to go back to 1 Peter chapter three, be prepared to give an account of the hope that is within you, says Peter to his audience. Giving that account is going to be a more and more challenging thing in the world of the 20th century. In order to do that, you gotta know what you're given an account of. You'll be well launched on that from your education here, but that has to continue. So radical discipleship, lifelong catechesis, biblical literacy, a rich sacramentality. The church grows from the Eucharist. The church is refreshed for mission in the sacrament of penance, reconciliation when we can bring all of the problems of being missionary disciples to the Lord in the person of his priest, all of our failures to be the missionary disciples we were called to be, and then go back into the world to do that which it is our privilege to do. But above all, baptism. The Catholicism of the future is a Catholicism in which we will own the meaning of our baptism in a way that's not been typical in Catholic circles for a long time. About 25 years or so ago, when I first started working in Washington with uh, evangelical Protestants on pro-life and religious freedom stuff, religious freedom in those days meant prying priests and nuns out of the gulag. Uh, we never thought it would meant our own country and its problems today, but so be it. That's a battle we have to fight. Anyway, so 25 years ago, I started meeting these people, and I discover they have a really interesting way of introducing themselves at a meeting. You know, you get 15 Americans in a room, and you go around, how do you, you know, who are you? Well, I'm Joe Smith, and I'm a lawyer, or I'm Jane Doe, and I'm a doctor, and I'm 
you know, Harry uh, Parker and I teach um, geometry at such and such a high school. Americans identify to themselves by what they do. That is not what these guys did. They would go around and it's, I'm Joe Jones and I was born again on, and they give you the date 10 years ago. And I'm Jane Smith and I was born again on, and she'd give you the date. Well, this would come around to me and I would say, well, I'm George Weigel and I was born again on April 29th, 1951, at which point I was precisely 12 days old. <laughs> that, would, um, that, would get, that would get some interesting conversations started. Sacramental regeneration, you know, whatever. But that intensity of identification that they had with their experience of the encounter with the Lord came back to me when I was writing Witness to Hope in totally different context. I was writing about John Paul II's first visit back to Poland, those nine days in June 1979, really turned the 20th century in a different direction. So, he goes to his little hometown of Wadowice, outside of Krakow, goes to the church where he had been an altar boy, etc. What's the first thing he does? He makes a beeline for the baptismal font and he kisses it. Because he knew that was the most important day of his life. Not the day he was ordained a priest, not the day he was consecrated a bishop, not the day he was elected pope, the most important day of his life was the day of his baptism. And we have to know that too. So, here's the question of the evening. All of you who know the date of your baptism, raise your hand. Well, okay, 5%. It's usually 3%, so you know you're in Steubenville when it's 5%. <laughs> Call your parents, get them to get out the Catholic paper from wherever they keep it, ask them what the date of your baptism is. Memorize it. It's the most important day of your life. Celebrate it somehow in a particular way. Know the date of your baptism. Those of you who are married here know the date of your wedding, or if you don't, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> Know the date of your baptism. It's more important than your birthday in some, in some respects. Know the date of your baptism. That, that's a very important part of this vision of the church that's being proposed to us by the council, John Paul II and his successors. Why? Because on that day, you everyone in this room was given a commission. You were given a commission to be a missionary disciple. In Redem Torres Misio, his encyclical on Christian mission, John Paul II said that the, the, there's a paradox, the paradox of faith is that defying all of the normal mathematical logic of the world, Faith increases the more you give it away. The more you offer it to others, give it to others, the more you share the gift you have been given, the more it grows in you. Now, this idea of a church in what Pope Francis has called permanent mission has come just in the nick of time because the culture around us no longer supports the transmission of the faith in the way it did as recently as 50 or 60 years ago. Indeed, the culture around us has become increasingly an impediment to the transmission of the faith because the culture has become what my friend, the Orthodox Jewish, comparative constitutional law scholar Joseph Weiler 
has called Christophobic. The culture has become Christophobic. You could smell this in the air. It's a pretty bad smell. You could smell it in the air for about the past 25, 30, 40 years. You could see it in manifestations of culture like the arts, movies, whatever. But now it's showing up in public policy and law in ways that are making things challenging, if not difficult. So, the Catholics of the future, if they want to share the gift that they have been given, are going to have to have the courage to be countercultural. But it's a different kind of counterculture than the 60s counterculture. That was a counterculture of against. It aimed at tearing down. This is a counterculture of four. It's a culture reforming counterculture, as I describe it in the book, Evangelical Catholicism. It's a counterculture whose purpose is to invite Western culture back to a recovery of its senses, which means a recovery of its initial uh, structure of ideas and moral truths on which the West was based. This is going to be a tough job. This is going to be a tough job. And before I get to how the Catholic University fits into that, just one story to illustrate the toughness, the difficulty. Um, you, unless you're from Spain, anybody here from Spain? Yay! Buenos dias! <laughs> Buenos noches, I suppose. Um, in 2007, the government of Mr. Zapatero, not a good guy, passed a law, which you can go read on the internet, on uh, gender identifications on national identity cards. Spain, like every other country in Europe, most countries in the world, has a national identity card. It's not a passport, not a social security card. It's a national identity card. Functions something like <coughs> a driver's license here. Except it's issued by, by the central government. Well, as a two, and it has a gender marker on it, male or female. As of 2007 in Spain, you can go into a court, you can sign an affidavit saying, I, Juan, am now Juanita, and without any surgical, chemical, or hormonal falderal, you will be given a new national identity card saying you are now Juanita. In other words, your gender will be changed by an act of your will. And the state will recognize that. I, when this happened, I said at the time, perhaps with more frivolity than the circumstances required, I said it's a terrible shame that Alan J. Lerner, who wrote the lyrics for My Fair Lady, is no longer alive. Because he'd have a lot of fun rewriting the most famous song in that show so that the most famous line in the show would now read, the dame in Spain is mainly in the name. <laughs> That's the degree of unreality with which we're content. How do you get a world addicted to unreality to see things the way they are? That's where this question of biblical literacy comes in. But that's a lecture for another day. The Catholic University, the Catholic institution of higher learning for the 21st century and the third millennium exists for one reason. It exists to equip disciples 
for mission. It exists to produce witnesses to Christ. As Pope Benedict XVI said at the Catholic University of America in 2008, fostering personal intimacy with Jesus Christ and communal <coughs> excuse me, witness to his loving truth is indispensable to Catholic institutions of higher learning. That's not something we do on the side. That's something that has to be at the absolute center and core of the university's mission. And by doing that, as John Paul II insisted, Catholic institutions of higher learning can be rescuers of Western civilization from this slough of not despond, but unreality in which we are now wallowing by reconnecting Western civilization to its three roots, the roots of Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome. Biblical religion, philosophy, Roman law. <coughs> Biblical religion, Jerusalem, which taught Western civilization that life is journey, life is pilgrimage, life is adventure, life is not cyclical, life is not just one damn thing after another, life is on the way. Greek philosophy taught Western civilization Excuse me. That there is, there are truths built into the world and into us, and we can access those truths through an exercise of reason. Rome, law, the rule of law is superior to the rule of coercion or brute force. The West has increasingly forgotten all three of those roots. The God of the Bible, Jerusalem, was thrown over the side in Western high culture in the 19th century by the phenomenon that Father Henri de Lubac called uh, atheistic humanism. A humanism which saw the God of the Bible as the enemy of human maturation and said he, he gotta go. Well, it turns out when you throw the God of the Bible over the side, when you throw Jerusalem out the window, Athens starts getting wobbly. Because unless you believe that the divine creator impressed the divine reason on the world through that reason we call the Logos, in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the Logos impress that rationality on the world such that the world is, is a knowable place. You get the meltdown of Western confidence and reason that took place in the 20th century, such that by the end of the 20th century, there were very few philosophy departments uh, in prestigious universities around the Western world who were prepared to defend the notion that, look, there is something called the truth, and we can get at it. I mean, the most they could say was there's your truth and my truth and whatever. Then, with Jerusalem tossed out in the 19th century and Athens tossed over the side in the 20th century, what happens to law? Well, if there's only your truth and my truth and neither one of us recognizes anything as the truth, what happens when your truth and my truth come into conflict. Well, what happens is what Friedrich Nietzsche foresaw. The will to power wins. I will impose my power on you, or you will impose your power on me. On April 19th, 2005, 19th or 18th, one of the two, at the mass for the election of the Roman Pontiff, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger described that accurately as the dictatorship of relativism. The use of coercive state power to impose a solution in a cultural context when there is no reference point called the truth 
and truths come into conflict. So Catholic universities, by being truly Catholic, by being places where Jerusalem and Athens and Rome are still in active conversation, help the West recover its cultural memory. And to that prescription of John Paul II, I would simply add Catholic institutions of higher learning also become rescuers of democracy. Democracy and decadence cannot coexist indefinitely. It takes a certain kind of people, possessed of certain virtues, living them in public to make the machinery of free politics and the free economy work. Otherwise, the machinery gridlocks and the dictatorship of relativism comes in from another angle. So by being authentically Catholic, by being places where the Catholic Church, which has been at the center of this Western civilizational enterprise for almost two millennia now, by being in a place where Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome are still revered, Catholic universities, Catholic institutions of higher learning both serve the cause of the recovery of the lost cultural memory of the Western world and become rescuers of democracy. We've seen this played out over the last 11 months by some of your young colleagues at another remarkable Catholic university, the, Catholic, the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv in Western Ukraine. I had the honor of giving the commencement address there in July of 2013. And I said to those students that I hoped they would be true to the heritage of the Church of Martyrs, the Greek Catholic Church in Ukraine, from which this remarkable new Catholic institution of higher learning, the only Catholic university in the former Soviet space, was built. Little did I know that four and a half months later, those students would be on Independence Square in Kiev, literally putting their lives on the line. Why? Not because they wanted access to Lady Gaga, but because they wanted a country that lived the truths that were at the foundation of the Western civilizational enterprise. One of the deeply unreported aspects of the Maidan revolution in Ukraine was its religious character. And the determination of people to build a society based on the moral truths inscribed in the world and in us, the moral truths we can know by both reason and revelation. This Catholic symphony of truth, as John Paul II sometimes called it, is most effectively communicated, it seems to me, by a liberal arts education. And here, too, your university is at the forefront of the renewal of Catholic higher learning in America by being immersed in this tradition of Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome, you learn not only the past, you become equipped to be a rescuer of cultural memory in the future and a rescuer of democracy. So what you do here at Franciscan University and what is being done in similarly situated and similar commi similarly committed Catholic universities throughout the country, and how well you do it. What you do and how well you do it are matters of real urgency, far beyond this corner of, of Ohio. They are urgently important for the United States and its future. They are urgently important for the future of Western civilization. So be the missionary disciples 
you were baptized to be, learn how to do that by becoming the authentic legates and heirs of the great civilizational tradition on which this university rests. Thank you.